Good afternoon. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is our honor to welcome you to the opening event for Hispanic Heritage Month here at Raritan Valley Community College. My name is Conrad Colon, and I am the Executive Vice President of Raritan Valley Student Government Association. And my name is Ashley Gefkinetti. I am Vice President of Leadership and Service of Phi Theta Kappa. It is student government and Phi Theta Kappa's honor and privilege to co-sponsor this event, along with the help of OLC and the Office of Multicultural Affairs. Without the assistance of those two departments, this event would not have been possible. If you look within your program, you will notice we included the Presidential Proclamation for Hispanic Heritage Month. Hispanic Heritage Month started September 15th and ends October 15th, 2014. Here at Raritan Valley, Hispanic Heritage Month will be celebrated throughout the entire month of October. And it is, our honor, it is our hope that the students of Raritan Valley attend this and many other events celebrating the, uh, this, this prestigious month uh, and celebrate the culture and history that is Hispanic heritage. We would like to now introduce Raritan Valley Community College's president, Dr. Dr. Mike, Mike McDonough. McDonough. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am delighted uh, to be able to open uh, this event for Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, this national event celebrates the histories, the cultures, and the contributions of Hispanic and Latino Americans in the United States. Uh, this national observation began in 1968 under the presidency of Lyndon Johnson and was then known as Hispanic Heritage Week. In 1988, President Ronald Reagan expanded the observation to cover a 30-day period, beginning on September the 15th and ending on October the 15th. Now, September the 15th has poetic significance because it is the anniversary of independence for Costa Rica, for El Salvador, for Guatemala, for Honduras, and Nicaragua. Mexico and Chile marked their independence on September 16th and 18th, respectively. This celebration, our meeting here today, adds resonance and significance to our fast-changing and dynamic society. The US Census Bureau documents the Hispanic population of the United States at 54 million people, or 17.1% of the total population. In New Jersey, the Hispanic and Latino population represents almost 20% of our state's population, being one of eight states with a population of more than one million Hispanic residents. Demographers estimate that by 2060, the Hispanic population of the United States will total 128.8 million people, or 32% of the population. Hispanic and Latino Americans steeped in traditions that are uniquely multi-ethnic and multicultural have had a profound impact on our history and on our cultural practices. Although I'm someone clearly not able to decipher the complexity of that influence, I experience the depth of that Hispanic influence in food, in music, in film, in religion, in literature, in politics, in engaged community advocacy, and in sports. We have all been shaped and enriched and made better by this incredible, rich tapestry. Let me acknowledge and thank today's sponsors, uh, the people and groups who really made this event possible. Arguello Latino Club, Phi Theta Kappa, the, uh, the Office of Multicultural Affairs, and most importantly, our VCC Student Government Club. Thank you. Now, without delay, it is my honor to introduce our guest, Edwin Pagan. Mr. Pagan is a native of Patterson. 
He is an educator. He is a civil rights advocate. He is a legislative advisor, a political commentator, and the founder and president of the Civic Organization for the Decolonization of Puerto Rico. Above all, he is an eloquent and persuasive spokesperson for making Puerto Rico the 51st state <laughs> and ending 520 years of colonization. As Jose Saldana, the former president of the University of Puerto Rico asserts in a shockingly simple way, quote, Puerto Rico deserves to become the 51st state of the union with the same rights and responsibilities as the rest of our fellow Americans. After all, we have been proud American citizens since 1917. It would be very unfair and an undemocratic act of prejudice on the part of Congress and a national discredit to ignore the plight for equal rights of 3.7 million American citizens. Please help me welcome to RVCC Edwin Pagan. I'm not Edwin Pagan. <laughs> um, but that was such a nice introduction that you should remember it when I step off the stage and our guest joins us. So um, the reason I'm here in between uh, President McDonough and um, Edwin is because uh, the organizing committee asked me to say a few things about the historical context that sort of frames this conversation. Uh, my name is Carl Linskug. I teach US and Latin American history here at RVCC. Um, and I'd like to just say a few words about how Puerto Rico came to occupy this peculiar status and its relationship to the United States. How did we get here? Well, it's well known that the United States was created when the British colonists decided that they no longer were satisfied with their colonial status. And by declaring independence and by making it a reality, the new nation, the United States, became a symbol of anti-colonialism and self-determination for the whole world to see. But by the late 19th century, the United States was busy building an empire of its own. Having already taken a vast area of land from Mexico in the 1840s, the Spanish-American War of 1898 offered the US another opportunity for expansion. After helping defeat Spain, the United States acquired a handful of new colonies, one of which was Puerto Rico. Now the US claimed to have liberated Puerto Rico from Spain, along with Cuba, the Philippines, and other territories. But it's also worth noting that before the transfer of control from Spain to the US, Spain had already agreed to a greater degree of autonomy and what they called home rule for Puerto Rico. After it became a US possession in 1898, Puerto Rico's status was unclear, and it's been shifting throughout the 20th century. So in 1917, Puerto Ricans were granted US citizenship. 30 years later, in 1947, the US government agreed to allow a greater degree of um, autonomy or um, self-rule for Puerto Rico. And in 1952, Puerto Rico became a commonwealth of the United States, and so it remains in 2014, a commonwealth hanging somewhere between a state and a colony. So what is to be done about this? That's what our guest, Edwin Pagan Bonilla, is going to be talking to us about. And we're so pleased to have him here. So please help, us, help me again in welcoming him, Edwin Pagan Bonilla. Wow. Uh, after the words of the president and Carl, uh, I am honored to receive this invitation on behalf of the president, uh, the organizations responsible for making this possible. And I am very excited to see the crowd that is here today uh, interested in this topic of Puerto Rico. Should it be considered, or might it be considered, or is it considered a modern 
apartheid uh, within the United States. But uh, before I, I start, I, I have some other things I want to share with you. And my first remarks is uh, Mr. President uh, quoted uh, briefly but powerfully uh, a phrase of one of the presidents of the Uni University of Puerto Rico, and I believe uh, that quoted well, it's been too much time. And Carl spoke about uh, Spain giving Puerto Rico some more time, some more uh, democracy. Uh, at the moment, it, we were under Spain as a colony. Let me just give you some quick facts. Puerto Rico was a colony of, the, of Spain for more than 500, for 419 years. It wasn't until 417 years after they gave us something called Carta Autonomica, in which they started to bargain some new democratic uh, elements with Puerto Rico. It's, it was too little, too late. And after that, we became what I want to speak to you about, which is Puerto Rico, the Commonwealth. And I'm excited because I, I just came from, from a luncheon with uh, uh, Dar the Shield and with the students of, of the club of, of leadership club. I, I, I'm sorry that I don't have the name with me. But I, mean, I, I was totally touched, not by uh, the amount of people, but of the content of the questions we could share and the information we shared. So I really, really appreciate that opportunity to provoke this awareness of what's happening in Puerto Rico. Uh, I would like to dedicate this presentation today to my brother, who's, uh, he's becoming 48 today, 47. Thank you, Rosie. Uh, so I really, really uh, would like him to know, because we're recording this, that I, he's in my thoughts and he's a strong fighter for statehood and decolonization of Puerto Rico. And I dedicate this, this to him and to my 15-year-old son, Edwin, whom I am so proud of here, that he is well spoken about what does he want Puerto Rico to become in the next years, and that is the 51st state of the United States of, United States of America. Uh, I'd like to, to start today by asking, is it right for 535 legislators to decide over the life and future of 3.6 million citizens that have no vote in Congress? Does it seem correct to you if 535 legislators can keep over 300 to 316 million American citizens under a potential threat of losing their voting rights, congressional representation, and economic benefits if they've, that they've earned in the states if they choose to move to Puerto Rico? And my third question, are you aware that of the concept blood tax? It is related to thousands of Puerto Ricans, men and women, whom have died defending democracy around the world since World War I under the orders of a commander in chief they cannot vote for. Saying that, I am humbled and excited for all the blessings and personal family and professional experiences and a proud public school system student, which includes my school 11 and school 15 of my hometown, Patterson, New Jersey. Those experiences have brought me to this moment of sharing with students, professors, and administrators of this community college 
as evolving leaders not only what is a civil rights problem in U.S. territory called Puerto Rico, yet opened the discussion of the alternatives, of the actions that we have to further as American citizens in order to end a shameful political relationship between Puerto Rico and United States federal government and it's finishing the unconcluded business of American democracy that maintains Puerto Rico as a possible modern American apartheid. I'm gonna to try to keep it simple and not to go into complicated concepts uh, and I would really like to share some information that will be descriptive and then we'll take the, the more complex issues in the questions and answer section, okay? So let's speak about today, what is Puerto Rico? And there was a very, yeah, I, I know someone was gonna help me there, thank you. We already passed the questions, but let's go directly to what is Puerto Rico? As of the, three, the Treaty of Paris of December 10, 1898, Puerto Rico became a possession of the United States. During 1898 through 1900, Puerto Rico was governed by U.S. military. In 1900, Act Foraker was passed. It provided for a civil governor named by the President of the United States with, all, with 11 councilmen also named by the president, but only five could be Puerto Rican of that 11-man council. It also created a popularly elected House of Representatives with 35 members and for the position of resident commissioner, which still exists today and created the Puerto Rican citizenship, making Puerto Ricans national, but not American citizens. Subsequently, in 1917, Congress passed the, jo the Jones Act, signed by President Wilson on March the 2nd of that year. Puerto Ricans were given U.S. citizenship and local government was expanded. The government still considered of a governor appointed by the president, but the Senate and the House of Representatives were elected by direct vote of Puerto Ricans as well as a Bill of Rights. Meanwhile, in the U.S. Supreme Court, the Downs and Bidwell case decided in 1901 established that judicial, the judicial doctrine that we Puerto Ricans belong to the U.S. but are not part of the U.S. They based their decision on the territorial clause of the U.S. Constitution in the second paragraph and section three in article four. This decision answered the question, did the Constitution follow the flag? Meaning, if we place the flag of the United States of America in whichever territory within the globe, does the constitution of that flag apply in that territory? The answer was no. They made an exception in Puerto Rico. Another case called Balzac versus people of Puerto Rico in 1922 decided that Puerto Rico was not an unincorporated territory that in order to be so, Congress had to express clearly that Puerto Rico was in American territory. In this matter, the Supreme Court created the unincorporated status out of the language and text of our federal constitution, meaning that the United States Supreme Court at that moment in time decided for the first time making it different as it was for the previous 37 U.S. territories that became a state, that Puerto Rico was to be treated differently and beyond the language of the Constitution, they created the concept of unincorporated territory in order 
to apply a doctrine in Puerto Rico in which we would be treated as belonging to but not forming part of the United States of America. These cases that I just spoke about are part of another group of cases called insular cases. And they essentially state that as an unincorporated territory, Congress can determine in economic matters, can discriminate in economic matters as long as there is rational basis for it in violation of the equal protection guarantee in the Constitution of the United States. Until 1947, the president appointed a governor for Puerto Rico. In 1950, Congress approved a bill, the public law called Law 600, permitting Puerto Rico to write its constitution, yet maintained all the fundamentals of the Jones Act of 1917. Until 1947, I, I should say, that Puerto Ricans had the moment in 1952 to approve their constitution and to come into this different name called the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, and if I can translate that in Spanish for a moment, Estado Libre Asociado. And when you're talking about Estado Libre Asociado, if we were to make a direct, a literal translation, it would mean a free, or we would read free associated state. Kind of what Carl was describing. We have a political uh, status in which we are treated in some matters as a state, considered as a independent republic in other matters, and for other matters considered associated with the United States. So this is something that up to this date, we do not clearly understand the position which was assumed not only by the cases, uh, or the insular cases considered by the US Supreme Court that permitted the US Congress to discriminate once they apply a, a law because they can say directly what law applies, is, applies and which law would not apply without having Puerto Ricans any saying in that matter. Okay, so Puerto Ricans have been brought to this situation in the United States by a legal system that has permitted the social and political system that actually is imposed in Puerto Rico. As a matter of a fact that I would like to share with you, I would also like to state that Puerto Ricans pay full tax, payroll taxes to fund Medicaid and Social Security, import, export, and commodity taxes as do all residents of the states of the union. Federal employees and those individuals and corporations who do business with the federal government also pay federal taxes. So we come to question, is it being applied without our consent that we are having a taxation, no taxation without representation problem within the archipelago? archipelago of Puerto Rico. Because that's, that, and I, am, I, I will uh, uh, say that Rosie Arroyo will assist me with, with different translations, because I am, I am trying very hard to uh, speak in English what I'm thinking in Spanish. So that's, that's part of the process that keeps us in, in continuously uh, uh, a process of trying to uh, affirm uh, and to double check what we're saying, okay? Uh, there's another fact that I would like to share with you before I go into the recent reports of the 
federal reports over Puerto Rico, is that 18,000 Puerto Rican men and women served in World War I, 16,000, 65,000, sorry, in World War II, 60,000 in Korean War, and 48,000 in Vietnam War. Over 1,200 1, have paid the ultimate price, and eight, and only eight, have received the highest military award, the Congressional, Congressional Medal of Honor. And since World War I, over two, 200,000 Puerto Ricans have fought in our country's military engagements, but proportionally, Puerto Ricans are always the largest number of armed forces uh, uh, participating in a war, okay? As it happened in, in Vietnam. Now, uh, in, in, in a very uh, personal uh, in, intention of, of giving a, a historic background of what has been the relationship of Puerto Rico and the United States, in, in, in those dates and what has happened and bringing, uh, bringing to the table that we are a commonwealth that is considered a U.S. unincorporated territory which is being discriminated by the judicial system that has permitted and decided in the insular, insular, insular cases that it can discriminate in economic issues and matters towards Puerto Rico, I would like to, uh, uh, to go over what, has, what are the recent federal reports on Puerto Rico. And I know that we've had many in the past. Yeah, please. But I would like to share the, the most recent ones. And I am going to read just one recommendation of this report by the President's Tax Force on Puerto Rico's status, dated of March 2011. The task force recommends that all relevant parties, the President, Congress, and the leadership, leadership and people of Puerto Rico, work to ensure that Puerto Ricans are able to express their will about status options and have that will accept the pond by the end of 2012 or sooner thereafter. The government of Puerto Rico has discussed the possibility of holding a plebiscite this summer that would seek to ascertain the will of the people of Puerto Rico concerning status without taking a position in the particular details of this proposal, the task force recommends that the president and Congress support any fair, transparent, and swift effort that is consistent with the ref and reflects the will of the people of Puerto Rico. If the process produces a clear result, Congress should act on it quickly with the president's support. Please keep that quote in mind. I would also like to go over to the next uh, re federal report which is the most recent one of June 2014, stating that, for example, Puerto Rico's residents have access to many federal programs and are subject to certain federal tax laws. However, for some federal programs, Puerto Rico or its residents are subject to different requirements or fundings, funding rules that are then are the states or their residents. Likewise, some federal tax laws apply differently to Puerto Rico residents and corporations than the residents of the states and the corporations in the states. Having said this, uh, Puerto Rico has a population of 3.6 million American residents until the census of the year 2000, we had over 4 million 
Puerto Ricans living within the four islands of Puerto Rico. And in 10 years, we've lost almost 400,000 Puerto Rican American citizens that have chosen to move entirely to the states. That's why you have a very big crowd of Puerto Ricans in Florida, in Pennsylvania, in New York, and in many other states. But it, it's, it has not happened just because the Puerto Ricans have chosen to move to the states because uh, any particular reason of, of, of making a change. It's been motivated because of the economic and political situation we are suffering in the island, especially the political uh, decisions and the judicial system that has permitted the US Congress to discriminate towards Puerto Rico in economic matters, making it a very uncomfortable, difficult situation and uh, work environment place for the Puerto Ricans that have been obligated to move. Now, to move to, to mo in, in, in particular to the states. Now, I would like to pass to question or to, to get to know uh, what is apartheid, which is another topic I would like to touch today. And for that, I would like there's another recommendation, and there's a, a quote by Mandela, which I would go over uh, after this video, I would like to share with you over or on the topic of apartheid. Apartheid in South Africa operated under the following principles. A significant white minority made laws for black majority. Two, economic disparities of salaries between the white and black communities. Three, classified into people categories, segregations. There, she was about to say the four categories, categories. There were blacks, there were whites, there were colored, and there were Indians. Uh, the other principle which sustained the social system of apartheid was separate into different residential areas. They decided that the whites were going to live in a, in a certain uh, place within South Africa, and the rest of the other 10 uh, uh, groups, or the, the blacks, were going to be divided into 10 other groups, and they were being assigned their territories. Okay? And the place where they would live, the place where they were. Uh, uh, Act and, and they would determine what would be the relationship with the white people in South Africa. Homelands were overcrowded and lacked jobs. Wages were low and strikes were illegal. Apartheid was economically motivated, but it was also based on a, on a legal system because the laws were drawn and were made to establish this illegitimate political system. I would like to pass now to, to the slide which has the similarities between Puerto Rico and apartheid in South Africa. I at least tried to question five similarities. In South Africa, the people, by law, were classified into colored, Indian, white, and black. In Puerto Rico, by law, we are classified as full American citizens or second-class citizens because we do not have the full benefit and rights of American citizenship. If you were to live in Puerto Rico, you would not have the right to vote for the president. You would not have the right to have two senators in at least 
five representatives to speak on your behalf and vote on your behalf in the US Congress. If you were to live in Puerto Rico, you would be able to do something that is as contradicting as the following. You would be able to participate in the national parties to elect the nominee for the presidency, whether you're Democrat or Republican, but once they become the candidate, you are not able to vote for the candidate, whichever was elected. Does that make sense? That's not the America I was taught in Patterson, New Jersey in school 15 and in school 11. That's not the America I pledge allegiance to for the most times of my life, every time I salute the flag. That's not the American way of living. That is a certain way of a shameful, historic uh, moment that has taken too long for 116 years under the US Constitution, and it's time for change. There's another uh, uh, similarity. No voting rights for blacks and colored. Exactly what they would do in Puerto Rico at this moment under the legal system and judicial doctrines developed in, in Puerto Rico, you cannot vote for the president, nor the vice president, nor the Congress, because in the insular cases, they decided that we belong to, but we are not part of the United States. But then again, they gave us the American citizenship in 1917 without the capacity or the ability to vote. And then again, they uh, permitted or promoted the, the creation of a constitution in which it uh, brought in all what the Jones Act of 1917 had already stated for, for Puerto Ricans and the relationship with the United States, and it made it impossible for, for us to vote. So uh, I don't know of an American way of living without being able to cast a vote. And I know that in, in, in the states, in general, you elect the president with a 35% of, of voting participation, but in Puerto Rico, the minimum we have is a 79.9% .9 of voting participation. We like to vote. We go to vote. We make it happen. So this is what we are asking the American citizens here in, in, in the states, in Jersey, and all around the, the rest of the 49 states to help us make this change through the power, the political power your vote has here in the states. The third thing I would also question is that separateness, okay? We belong to, but not a part of the United States, as I stated. Uh, law number 46 in 1959 eliminated participation of blacks in parliament. Well, what, what the United States did for Puerto Rico in, 19, in 1900 under the uh, Foraker Act, they created the resident commissioner to be our representation in Congress. But could you understand a resident commissioner who it, whom is representing 3.6 million people can only vote and discuss while he's in a commission, but cannot vote when, it, when he goes to the floor? He can speak in the floor, but he cannot vote in the floor? Is this a very modern way of doing the same things that happened in South Africa in the 1940s and 30s? And as finishing this, this uh, similarities that I would like to establish, in South Africa, social discrimination system relied on legal system. Well, Puerto Rico, actual territory, colonial status, relies on the US Constitution. It, 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 it's, it's, it's shameful to say that under that territorial clause, the Congress is capable of saying 
of, of determining, of deciding, of establishing any law or regu uh, regulation to uh, prohibit uh, the full access of American uh, citizenship to all Puerto Ricans. What have we done with this situation? And there, there we're finishing. I would like to share a video with you of what have we done and then what are we intended to ask you and to invite you to help us do to finish this shameful, uh, shameful page of the American democracy in Puerto Rico. It is not right. It is simply not right that we can go to war and yet not vote for the commander in chief. It is not right that we pay federal taxes. And as a matter of a fact, for the year 2010 and the year 2011, the, uh, the people of Puerto Rico paid more federal taxes than the state of Vermont. And we cannot have the opportunity to vote for our president nor elect representation for Congress. It is not right that we have our people dying uh, and, and, and going into many other wars and, and we cannot uh, live the benefits of that American flag and the democracy it represents. Before we get there to the video, and, and please let me know when we're ready, I would like to also speak about uh, a situation, and there's a slide of, of how uh, the President and the Congress have been concerned becoming the police of democracy around the world, and they have a shameful situation to attend here in, in, in a domestic, in their domestic relationship with Puerto Rico. Uh, recently, the ambassador uh, of Russia to the United Nations questioned and asked the United States, why should you be concerned of what Russia is dealing with Ukraine and Crimea if you have not dealt with the situation of Puerto Rico, whom also voted on November 6, 2012, which were the slides that I would share when we go to the Q&As, uh, in, in, for the first time, we made possible, we made possible the, the clear expression after 521 years of colonialism that we do not, that we reject the actual st territorial status and that it is the moment for change. And we chose, we took that decision with a 54% no? Okay. We took that uh, decision with the 54% of, vo uh, of voters, uh, and we also elected statehood as the option to finishing the colonial status in Puerto Rico with a 61% of our votes, and nothing has happened yet. The only thing that President Obama has done it w is exactly what President Bill Clinton did in the past, assigned $2.5 million to, some, to, to the people of Puerto Rico to educate, to go again into another plebiscite, into another uh, 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 electoral moment of, of choosing between the alternatives of decol decolonization. So, uh, I, 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 I think the video, no, it's not, no? It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. To the flag from the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
This site will be an opportunity for Puerto Rico to send a strong message to the Congress and to the nation. The voices of three and a half million American citizens in Puerto Rico constitutes a formidable force. If you favor statehood as I do, it's important that you vote. Let Congress know now. We are with you and we will support you. Don't send the wrong message. My friends, as you consider whether or not you wish to continue being part of the United States, I want you to know one thing. The United States will welcome you with open arms. We have always been a land of varied cultural backgrounds and origins, and we believe firmly that our strength is our diversity. There's much Puerto Rico can contribute to our nation, which is why I personally favor statehood. We hope you will join us. Thank you, and God bless you. In my first State of the Union speech as president, I supported statehood for Puerto Rico. I am certain that Puerto Rico will be welcome as a state. Now this is a matter for Puerto Ricans to decide and I urge everyone to vote in the November plebiscite. Puerto Ricans have made many contributions to our nation, many with their lives. And with that in mind, it is my sincere hope that the Puerto Rican people will vote for statehood. Estadidad ahora. Y hoy 
27 de julio del 2014 es el grito y la proclamación de la igualdad y de la estadidad para todos los puertorriqueños y más importante aún esto es un asunto de unidad we are the brave. Yes, we are the brave We'll fight you in day The name of the brave We are the U.S. of A For those on the way probably heard about this uh, very important South African uh, Nobel Prize called Desmond Tutu. He says that if you choose to be neutral in a situation of injustice, you've taken the oppressor's side. And if the president, the Congress, and the rest of the American citizens choose to look to the side while the Puerto Ricans are living this lack of democracy, you should and they should question what side have they chosen. Is it possible for us to become the 51st state? Would there be uh, a design for that 51st state, a flag for that moment? Well, yes, I want to share one. And it looks, and it looks exactly like the flag you and I see every day and salute. Oh, we, we added the thing in the bottom just for the people to know that there are 51 stars there. Because if we were, would have not done that, they wouldn't have noticed it. This is important because the will of the people has to be respected. P Puerto Rico voted. It's time to act. Thank you. Conrad and I are going to be helping facilitate the discussion, but what we're most interested in is for you to ask your questions to Edwin and to be able to have a dialogue here. So please um, step up to a microphone. I don't know if we have microphones that are floating around as well. Okay, so if you have a question, please come up um, and One, come to the microphone and, and ask your question. Sure. No, it's okay, folks. We don't bite. You can move closer, all right? <laughs> Is he? Yeah, he's, he's coming in for Please use the mic. We're also recording this um, for podcasts and things, so you really need to use the mic so it, your question gets documented. I want to defer if any students have a question first, but I do have a question. So don't be afraid. Come on up. Come on up. And you can, you can form a queue, too, so that we're all ready. We can just keep going through the ideas. If it's easier for you, there is a microphone over there, so some students want to go to that one, too. 
So, hi everyone, thank you so hi. much for your presentation. We really appreciate you coming. It's a real honor for us. Thank you. Uh, I just had a question, and I'm not sure about the facts, but uh, I, I thought, or I, I heard during the last vote, uh, or, or there were several votes about um, Puerto Rican uh, statehood or independence, is that true? And is there also a kind of a counter movement or a more radical movement about Puerto Rican independence as opposed to statehood? Is, is that a, a counter trend? Okay. You were gonna answer something? Um, no. Go ahead. Yeah? Go ahead. Okay. okay. I, I, I'd like, uh, Erica, if, if the system is, does permit the slide of, of the plebiscites, okay. if that can happen, and I'm gonna answer, awesome. okay? Uh, and, and thanks for that question. It is really important for us to get some information out there. First of all, yes, there was a plebiscite. As a matter of fact, there's, there have been four plebiscites, 1967, 1993, 1998, and the last one was 2012. In that plebiscite 2012, which you're, which you're asking uh, particularly, yeah. what happened with, with the votes for statehood and for independence, right? Right. Okay, if that can help, I'm gonna give you the specific numbers. It's right there, okay? Uh, 16,000, uh, sorry, 74,895 voted for independence. Uh, 16,744 uh, left it in, a, let, me, let me go over, were voided, okay? And that big number of uh, 498,604 voted in blank. 454,768 voted for free association. And 834,191 voted for statehood. My question is, in what place do you know around the world or America? include every single territory or the 50 states, would a, a blank valid count? Do you know one? No, you do not know one. And I, and I would ask the history professor, do you know of any existing state in which a, a blank valid would count? No, the answer is no, okay? So what I'm trying to tell you is, uh, that's a big chunk of number right there, whom voted in, uh, uh, in blank. Uh, or, but as it is in Puerto Rico, it is in the states, votes in blank are not counted. So when you have that to the side and you count or you consider what is uh, uh, legitimate, uh, legit, legitimate, Legitimo, eh, dentro de eso, uh, I could go, I could go hard in Spanish, okay? Eh, lo que, what you consider legitimate in, 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 the, in the votes, the, in the options, you have a 61% of American citizens choosing statehood. Now, is there a movement of, of in, towards independence? There's been a movement there. Historically, historically, if we would have had chance to go over the three or four plebiscites, uh, you, could have, you could have seen that it's been uh, decreasing significantly, okay? It's been in 1967, uh, independence had uh, 3,601 votes. 1993, uh, independence had 6, 000, no, 75,000 620 votes. In 1998, uh, independence had 39,838 votes. And when you take it to uh, the 2012 plebiscite, independence had 74,895 votes. In terms of percents, the, the percentage, which is something that we work a lot with, they, they are less than the 5% of our population. Thank 
You spoke about all the disadvantages of being uh, a territory. Um, are there advantages? And I'll push you in the right direction. Um, maybe we brought a lot of our companies, corporations went to Puerto Rico because there are lower taxes, working wages lower. Uh, don't you think that they would pull out all that and go somewhere else? They would be cheaper if it becomes a state. See, uh, this is one I, I really want to answer with, with, with total uh, integrity and honesty. Uh, the decolonization process of Puerto Rico has to be understood and taken forward as a human rights and civil rights issue. But there is a reality that being a commonwealth as it is today, it has and it, it engages in, in, in some benefits to some corporations. Yes, it, it does. But uh, when I put over the table, uh, the dignity of the people of Puerto Rico and the capacity that every other state has demonstrated to uh, keep growing economically besides the benefits that we are providing in Puerto Rico. And every other state, every single other 50 state have been uh, in a better economical position than we are actually today. Well, my, quest, my, my answer is uh, no, because we're, 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 we're not in the political situation we deserve to be in terms of dignity and human rights, and we're not in the economic place we, we should be because the laws that we are subjected to and discriminated by the U.S. Congress do not permit the Puerto Ricans to be in a greater uh, economical, uh, better situation as in any other state. So uh, does it have benefits for the moment? Yes, it does. Does it solve the situation? Can we be, the question is, can we be better if we are uh, a, a, the 51st state economically? Yes, we can. Every other state is better than we are. Every single other state is. Puerto Rico is actually uh, the La Casa Acreditadora. Uh, 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 she helped me with that one. La Casa Acreditadora. Uh, the, 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 the credit rating uh, companies around the world have been uh, degrading Puerto Rico for, since 2006. Downgrading. Oh, okay, uh, it's, it, there, there's a very, very difficult political, uh, economical situation in Puerto Rico. Uh, uh, our, our, I, I had some other information that I would leave uh, that for, for further sharing uh, of what's happening with, with our workforce, of what's happening with the people who are, uh, why are people not participating in the workforce? Why many people, so many people are leaving the island? I mean, in, in, in less, uh, of in, a, in less or in a decade, you've had uh, more than 400 people leave the island. 400,000, okay? So that's, that's, that's a lot of people. And it's because we have a very tight, intense uh, economical situation because we're, we're, we're banded. We, we do not have congressmen or congresswomen to sit at the table at the moment that they're deciding how are they going to distribute the budget to say, no, well, this is the chunk that goes to Puerto Rico. This is the part that goes to Puerto Rico and equality. Okay? We're not asking to get more than the states. We're asking to receive the same in, in proportion of our, uh, uh, of our people, uh, of the amount of people we have in the states. But we do, but in, in Puerto Rico, but we do not have anyone who can speak and vote on our behalf there. And I'm sure that if we, we have a 79.9% .9 minimum particip, uh, electoral participation uh, level in Puerto Rico, I'm sure that if we had the right to vote, every single president, presidential candidate would visit us to make possible their election because as would happen in Florida, uh, in, in recent elections, you know... Puerto was, Ricans do have the right to vote if they live on the mainland. Oh, that's right. You're totally right. And that is what is totally wrong. That is a right statement, that is a fact, but it, that's what is totally wrong. Why should we have to leave our archipelago, archipelago, 
Why should we have to leave our family? Why should we have to leave our schools? Why should we have to leave our people to come to the mainland and vote? It is not right. And on the other hand, we are paying the taxes. We are, we are participating actively in, in, in every uh, war engagement the United States goes to. It is not right that we would have to take a plane. We can solve this easily. We could pay a, a, a ticket and move, and move to the mainland, but that's not right. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead. I get passionate about it I, and emotional about it, so I'm sorry if I, if I keep answering. Well, this is a question uh, about you. Um, you grew up in Patterson, New Jersey, and I was wondering uh, what got you interested in uh, activism and this issue that you're talking about today? And also, when did you begin living in Puerto Rico? Okay, I, be, I, I lived in Patterson until I was 12 years old. I, I began to live in Puerto Rico in 1981. Uh, so you should figure out that I'm basically like 28 now. Uh, <laughs> besides that, huh? Yeah, God, yeah. Don't, don't, don't even try to translate what Rosie is saying now. Uh, what motivated me, what got me uh, involved in this uh, first, my personal experiences in church, uh, and second, my, form, my education formation, educational formation at the university brought me uh, to, to know some, some uh, people, uh, uh, inspiring people as Martin Luther King, as Rosa Parks, as, as Mandela, and, and, and some people in our island who fought as Luisa Ferre, Pedro Rosselló, our former governor, uh, for statehood, and, and I got involved in this. What, what's happened, we've made, we've made a big change. That plebiscite, 2012, was the first time we managed to, to get together, uh, to, to, to bring together people from all three ideologies, the, the people who believe in independence, the people who believe in statehood, people who believe in free association, all voted against, against uh, the actual uh, status quo. And, and we rejected for the first time in history since Spain and United States, ha we have been under their, their power. For the first time in history, we've rejected co co uh, colonialism and we stood up for a change. Uh, the people, uh, what's, what's going on in, in terms of grassroots movement in the island. Uh, we recently had a march the 27th of, of July of 2014. We had over, over 20,000 people walking and marching in our, sta in our uh, state capital or in our Commonwealth capital uh, uh, requesting to respect the vote of the people because it's, nothing has happened after September 6, 2012. You know, to, to respect the will of the people of Puerto Rico. So we, we, we've managed uh, the people to take charge and command of this issue, leave behind uh, the political candidates and, and the political party agendas, and uh, we're furthering and building and confirming uh, the people's agenda to make statehood possible for Puerto Rico. Thank you. Thank you for the question. How did you lead others to become so politically active? How would I, uh, well, let, uh, thank you for that question. And I, and because of not being able to have all the documents I was about to present, I couldn't tell you this. Uh, the way I see it, the discrimination and a grade of oppression happening in Puerto Rico is not a 3.6 million American citizens issue. It is a 320 million American citizens issue because it should concern you and it concerns me because you have the potential threat of not being able to vote if the other way around, when the, the, I, I was asked, we, we Puerto Ricans can solve our situation just taking an airplane and moving to any state. But if you would move to Puerto Rico, you would lose your voting rights. 
And as I stated in our, in our luncheon, uh, the facts are that the legal system that has been created by Congress and the presidency, if Obama were to move to Puerto Rico to spend the rest of his days after he finishes his second term, he will not be allowed to vote for the next president, whether it's Hillary, whether it's a Republican, whomever it is, he will be stripped from his voting rights. That is not right America. That is not the American way of living. That is something that should concern you and should move you to make this a better place for all. Because Puerto Rico cannot only be seen and considered as it is promoted through tourism, as the best beaches, the best party places, the best, uh, uh, the best rum in the world. No, we are much more than that, than our beaches, than our rum, than our partying, than our old San Juan, than our alcapurrias, uh, arroz con gandules, and lechon, all this great food we can, we can manage to do. That, that is not, that is not what should attract you as an American citizen to Puerto Rico. What should attract you to Puerto Rico as an American citizen, besides that, because we really want you to go every year, because we're rated the best place in the world to celebrate Christmas. We are rated uh, uh, to have one of the best, most beautiful beaches in the world, in, in Flamingo Beach, in the island of Culebra. So, this is an awesome place to go. We have an awesome rainforest called El Junque. We have, uh, we have many places you can go visit and see, but this is not only sightseeing. This is, as an American citizen, this is uh, an issue that should concern you because you are also threatened. It's not only us, because we can solve it, but if you move there, not, not only that, as I, as I quoted in, a, in an example, and I took Eva as an example, if she were to finish uh, uh, or accomplish her retirement and decided to go to live to Puerto Rico, she would be uh, not able to, to receive the benefits of some uh, economic benefits she would earn or, or, or or uh, participar, este, uh, she's participated and, and, and paid for. If she had, if she would apply uh, uh, for social, uh, supplemental social insurance, which is uh, something they provide, SSI, they provide uh, uh, with uh, social security, just because you live in Puerto Rico, you cannot, you will not receive it. Why? Because the, the, the Congress said in their insular cases that they can discriminate once they find uh, economic uh, rationality in, in, in economic matters. That is not right. That has to be bettered. And we can only do it through the power of vote. Hello. Um, so you talked a lot about uh, the political, judicial, and economic uh, benefits of going, uh, being part of statehood. But what about the uh, the cultural effects that statehood will provide? I mean, if we look at like states like Hawaii, where their culture has been damaged, are we going to lose uh, Castellano? Are we going to lose Spanish as well? Are we going to be educated in the language of the United, uh, like English? Are we going to lose our yeah. language? Uh, these are some things that I think about when we're talking about statehood. Uh, a very unique culture that we have in Puerto Rico. Okay. It's a very great question. We are reaching the point in time where some students may have to go to class. Uh, we ask that you stand up and leave. And for those of you who are in the back, feel free to come take some of the seats in the front. Edwin? A great question. Do you know that, uh, first of all, as, as, as I've been taught and we've studied, there's not an official language in the United States. Uh, made by law. Federally? Is there? There is not, right? Thank you. There is not. So there is no federal obligation legally for us, once we become a state, to uh, change uh, our 
our first or uh, 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 the, the right to choose which language should we use as first language or second language. Uh, you can go over to the state of Florida. I, I was recently there a couple of years back. I went to the court. I had a matter to solve. They told me in which language would, do you wish to file, in Spanish or English. Uh, so I, we will not lose uh, speaking Spanish culture. Uh, we've been under the colonial, colonialism for 116 years in which they can uh, unilaterally apply any law to extinguish our culture. Becoming a state, we'll have two senators, five uh, representatives who will voice and will defend uh, the, the, the cultural expression of Puerto Rico. And as a matter of fact, uh, Hawaii receives federal funding to protect and promote their culture. I wish we would become a state and we can uh, further the promotion of our culture in Puerto Rico becoming a state. So uh, are we concerned about losing that? No. Uh, and I know it's a question that has not be, been asked, but uh, will we lose our participation in, 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 in the Miss Universe, which is a, a concern for other uh, Puerto Ricans? Uh, I mean, first that I, I don't find that to be so relevant, but the fact is that it, that's a private uh, entity whom, decide, whom decides that. And we do have beautiful women in Puerto Rico that can compete greatly with any other women in the 50 states, and we, we've, we've got five, you know? We've got five Miss Universes. Then there's another question, will we uh, be part of the ULA? U.S. Olympics, or would we have our own uh, Olympic committee? Well, that's another fact. Uh, it's a private institution, and I'm just going to refer you to, uh, refer anyone to what's happened with Hong Kong. And they, they became part of, of another nation. Uh, they still keep their uh, uh, Olympic committee. Thank Fantastic. you, sir. That was a very good question. Ma'am. Hello. Okay, that was one of my concerns because I'm Puerto Rican. Great. And my family. De, de donde? De donde? Um, my mother's there. Okay. Utuado. Okay, Utuado. My father, Pepino. Okay, San Sebastian. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. And you know, one of the concerns was that. Well, no. <laughs> one of the concerns was that, like my, you know, my family from Puerto Rico, you know, they're they were iffy about Puerto Rico becoming a state because of the situation, like the inheritance being changed. And you know, a lot of them have that heart that they want to stay as a Hispanic, you know, Puerto Rico to stay as it's supposed to be. But one of the other thing is that they wanted to become a state because they want more, you know, able to do more things like us we do here. And like you said, you're right. A lot of Puerto Rican people moved here to be able to have the same rights. Same rights and, 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 and more benefits and, and, a, and a better economical situation into progress. Now, but let me ask you something. Uh, uh, how many of these and you don't have to be Puerto Rican. What happens every, every, every month of June in, of every year in the Fifth Avenue in New York City? We have our biggest parade in I don't know of any other place in the world where they exhibit so many Puerto Rican flags as in that, that uh, parade. I mean, have Puerto Ricans, and, and the ones that are sitting here, and, and you can also probably answer this. Have you stopped eating your arroz con andules and, 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 and alcapurrias? Have you stopped speaking Spanish at your house? Have you stopped uh, dancing salsa? No. No, right? And we encourage that. Blood. Have you stopped just, just uh, having fun uh, 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 saying your, your carajo and your coño once in a while? <laughs> You know, have you stopped just, you know, making it, making it, making it real, making it us? No, no. Have you stopped engaging with other Puerto Ricans? No. This is another moment in our history. And I, and I, and I, and I, and I, I I'm very voiceful against this in, in the island because they are still teaching uh, a discourse of 1950s and 1940s that, that we would be stripped from, from our identity, yeah, our cultural identity. Say, yeah. But hey, what is our identity today? Because 
What Puerto Rican living in, Puerto, in, in within the four, uh, four islands there, Archie, uh, archipelago, archipelago, archipelago doesn't, doesn't go to Walmart instead of going to El Colmado. Mm? And you do have the Colmados here in Jersey and in New York and in every other place. Okay, bodegas, right? So, what Puerto Rican uh, does not uh, have not only Guapa TV, eh, Telenoticias, y Univision, and they have all the rest of the channels, uh, 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 cable TV, okay? I have one of my most powerful examples is one of my nieces. She is born and raised in Puerto Rico, and she is totally, totally bilingual and pro, uh, totally proficient in English. Is, is that because... Uh, uh, she had the best English teachers in the world? Probably yes, probably no. But she's been exposed to what's our new dynamic, our new environment. This is globaliz globalization moment. This is the moment in, in which everyone is open to, to different uh, cultures. And there is that, uh, these dynamics that are uh, furthering cultures. You cannot shut down. I mean, it's, it's time to open up. Now, by, by Puerto Rico becoming a state, is it really going to help Puerto Rico or is it going to hurt Puerto Rico? In the states that, you know, people are concerned about Puerto Rico, by the taxes and everything, and doing that, you know, the living is different than here. Okay, let me, let me give you some facts there also. And please, please listen to this, and thank you for being here, because I know it, we're, we're almost, we've almost been done. This is, this is the moment. Uh, in terms of, of, of taxes, First of all, there is a myth that we do not play, pay taxes. That is not true. We, 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 pay t we pay federal taxes, and as I stated before, uh, in, we paid in 2010 and 2011 more taxes in the state of Vermont. Not only that. Uh, would, we, would we be subjected to, to, to uh, paying uh, more taxes than in the states, or, or all Puerto Ricans should be afraid of paying taxes? The reality is that almost a 60 to a 70 percent of Puerto Ricans live under the conditions of poverty. Mm -hmm. So, in the states, if 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 you do, uh, si tú no generas, if you don't generate uh, fifty thousand dollars or more. Uh, Tú no tienes en muchos en en many states you don't have to pay some of some of the taxes, okay? So you you're you're exempted from 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 some taxes of the state. Uh, yet when you do pay your taxes, you're entitled to receive like the earned income tax credit for your taxes, which we cannot receive because we are a Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. So if we were to become a state, we would, uh, as the president was uh, in saying in his opening statement, we would be uh, open to correspond fully in our obligations and our benefits. We would pay what we have to pay because there's a certain amount of our uh, population, which is p probably a 30 percent, from a 25 to a 30 percent, that would have to pay more because they earn more and it's right to pay taxes if you earn more money, but the majority would not have that uh, pressure or that obligation to pay more taxes, okay? okay my friend kissed while she went back then because she had to go and she wanted to find out, um, she stated that uh, what can the people of color make a difference for current apparent head in Puerto Rico? What can the people, what can what? She wants to know what can the colored people, you know, like you were talking about color, uh -huh. make the difference for the current political apartheid in Puerto Rico. Okay. Oh yeah, apartheid. apartheid. Yeah. yeah. Well, yes. It's it's exactly what the people uh, th that are considered white can do. Exactly what the people that are Hispanic can do. It's exactly what the people that are considered Asian can do. It's exactly what any American citizen living in the United States can do, and it's furthering through your votes, through your voice, with your congressmen, with your governors, with your political elected officials, that, Puerto, that there is something wrong in America that needs to change, and it's that Puerto Ricans cannot be treated different. So we really, really, really are asking 
for, for your uh, uh, political uh, power, el poder político de ustedes, mm -hmm. the, to, to use it to make a change for us. Okay. And, and in, in which way? Well, contact as we're doing the, your congressmen, your congresswomen, your elected officials, the president, and, and let them know that Puerto Rico voted for statehood and it is time to act accordingly to the will of the people of Puerto Rico. That's called democracy. Other, other than that, that it's, it's not uh, the democracy and the American way of life. I would ask you also, we gave you a document, which is the ballot that we, that we had before us, that we had before us in, in, November, in November of 2012. Please, if you have a chance, it's in Spanish and in English. I just want you to read the instructions and to vote, because there was, there, there, there was a concern of many other people regarding the ballot, okay? which I would share after your votes if I have a moment, because I'm not going to contaminate you uh, with, with, what I, with, with what was being said. If you have a moment, you have a pencil, please read and, 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 and vote. Okay? Okay. Thank you for your question, and, and we're counting on you to make, this, to make a change okay. Okay? with the power of your vote, the power we don't have. Okay? Thank you. Hi, um, thank you for your time. You've really changed my perception of this issue and I appreciate your being here. Wow, so, oh wow. That makes me emotional and makes me more compromised <laughs> with this, okay? Um, I was just wondering, when you're talking about adopting a state that was originally an island, that makes me think of Hawaii. So I was wondering what the similarities and differences are surrounding the circumstances of when Hawaii was adopted as a state. Was there something that we gained from it? Why did we make Hawaii a state when we're not making Puerto Rico a state? We made, we made it to be, to, and I know I have very short time, but we made uh, Hawaii a state because Hawaii requested to become a state. It came through different uh, political process and, and plebiscites and referendums, and they chose statehood. And uh, they, they, they had to include the uh, La Agenda Ciudadana, the, the civic agenda to make it possible. And that's what we're doing now in Puerto Rico. We've already chosen to become a state, We, we need our, our civic agenda in the streets uh, to make this possible. And as I, as I told the, the people at the luncheon before, uh, I've been inspired by, by Rosa Park. Uh, but honestly, the way we see it today, the way we see it in Puerto Rico, uh, and you know this story about Rosa Park. We, we, we in Puerto Rico, 3.6 million Americans, American citizens, we still feel that we are sitting in the back of the bus. And that is not right. Uh, does it take thousands? It might take thousands, but it started with one. So that's the importance of we, it, whether we had 500 or 600 or 10 people here today. This awareness This, this, this feedback you gave me is, is just awesome. I'm, I'm, you know, my, my heart is, is this big, you know, and I go back home knowing that someone else in, Port in, in the States is, might just take concern of making this a better place for all Americans. It is not right for us to go die fighting for the, Amer for the American democracy we preach for I the people in Iran and have Puerto Ricans die and cannot vote for their president and make it a better place to live without having to leave our island. That is not right. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Hi, Edu. Uh, would I say something about soldiers? Because we talk about voting here in mainland or even Puerto Rico. But it's a situation when the uh, soldiers, uh, where their uh, fort is from Puerto Rico, they go overseas, and they're in the middle in the line of duty. They don't give in to them the ballot to vote. So that's 
a shameful and a painful uh, situation in there because we are very comfort here and and we think uh, just because the right of the boat, but when these guys go overseas to defend our line and election comes and some of them get the ballot for both and some of them not because they come from Puerto Rico. That's a hard one right there. And it's very shameful. Just if you want to say something, just, just yeah, say. I, I appreciate your comment. It is, it, is, it is totally shameful. It is something we have to change. Uh, and uh, it took, as I, as I shared before today, uh, we had Puerto Ricans fight in the Korean War. Many were awarded the Congressional uh, Gold Medal of Honor. And it took the Congress and the President over, over 60 years to have the Puerto Ricans who fought there in the same heroic way to pin, to pin, I'm sorry, to pin the medal in their chest. Why? Why? I'd like to ask a question to Edwin. I'm probably about out of time. We're going to keep an eye on Richeline here for that. Um, you probably, we're all, probably all know this, but um, we haven't really mentioned it yet. Today, the Scots are going to vote on the status of Scotland and if they're going to remain um, part of the United Kingdom. I know people in Catalonia, in Spain, and around the world who've been dealing with their own independence issues or status issues are very much watching this. So I'm curious what you're thinking about this as the Scots go to the, to the polls to decide their status and what, what the out outcome might mean for Puerto Rico. I don't know if, if, if Erica, if the slide of, of uh, the report of Ukraine, can you manage? Uh, it's after that. It's more towards the end. Yeah, but, but, but it, um, I'm glad that's, that's happening around the world. And, and they, 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 what I'm, let, me, let, me, let me state it this way. Uh, their vote might be respected. And if they choose in a majority, in a clear majority, to become independent, they might become independent. And if they choose to maintain their union, they might stay in the union. The reality in Puerto Rico, we already chose statehood and rejected colonialism. Nothing has happened. In Crimea, the situation going in Ukraine, the, re the Russian president it's a, it's a, it, right? There's a questioning of if it was totally democratic or not, but in less than 24 hours, they signed him into the union. And then Obama steps in, no, no, you're, 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 you're doing something that's undemocratic. And they reply, you should take care of Puerto Rico instead of looking towards Russia. That was... Okay, even, yeah, yeah, those were the two, the two, yeah, thank you very much, okay? So it's, it's just, it's just obnoxious. It's just obnoxious. That is not right. Uh, it is, it is not right. I hope that the people can uh, clearly uh, express their mandate uh, as we did in Puerto Rico and that they would be respected. And let me, let me just affirm something that might cause a little bit of, uh, well, controversy, which is if I do not receive the respect of the people in Congress and the president towards the uh, uh, democratic will of the people of Puerto Rico towards statehood, I would prefer the independence of Puerto Rico and not to keep Puerto Rico as a colony, as it is today. It is a matter of dignity. We cannot stand for dignity. We stand for democracy. Well, on that note, um, Edwin, um, I just want to say on behalf of the college, thank you so much for coming here. Um, the Office of Multicultural Affairs um, is very proud to have, as our first program, 
for this academic year to have someone like you who was willing to travel and come to us to be able to share information. I think for our students and for our faculty, and I know for myself, I learned a lot. And that, that continuing of educating ourselves is what the purpose of Rowden Valley Community College is about. I know that Pre Professor Lynn School is running a um, diversity class on Latin American studies. We want to encourage not only our students, but our faculty and staff to also take that class with Professor Lynn School, because I know that for us as a community, learning about other people um, in the world, learning about ourselves, um, our participation as um, informed citizens of New Jersey is very important. So thank you. Thank um, you. Eva, um, I'd like to thank Eva. Um, she um, is our new administrative assistant in um, the Office of Multicultural Affairs. And the work that I do is always so important to have a conversation. So the conversation that you guys were having here is a conversation that I had with Eva when she returned back from Puerto Rico. And it's because of being able to talk about issues that cut across generations, that cut across ethnic lines, that cut across um, states um, where we come from. And it's that dialogue that really um, brings forward insight um, and um, knowledge. So thank you, Eva, for having that conversation with me back in the summer. Well, there's not too many of us left here, but I just want to remind everybody that we do have other programs. They're listed in the program um, for Hispanic Heritage Month. We have the uh, Cesar Chavez movie, the one with America Ferreira. We're going to be viewing that and discussing it. I don't recall the date. October the 8th. And then we're also going to have a Taste of Latin Culture. October 9th. October 9th. And then we're going to... <laughs> And then um, we're also going to have the, um, oh yeah, the Festival of Words Literary Celebration. So we encourage students to come out and read um, works from Latino artists. That's on October 16th. And I think for now, I think that's what we have for now. But, you know, on behalf of our office and student government and Phi Theta Kappa, and I want to thank Phi Theta Kappa and student government for really supporting this um, this event. You know, it was great. And and this and Edwin Pagan, there's not enough I could say about you. You know, you were great. I didn't know you had all this in you. You know, <laughs> but, uh. and Carl, Carl, you're wonderful. You know, I just you know I'm just beginning to get to know you and you know the passion that you have and you know all the knowledge you have and. You know, we were all in it together and we made it happen. And Conrad? And if, awesome. if I could just say something on behalf of student government, Phi Theta Kappa, I wanted to thank all of you for coming out. And especially you, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, uh, thank you Carl. And of course, this wouldn't be possible without all our sponsors that made this event happen. But now you have taken the first step uh, to learn about this issue that is so important in today's world. Uh, that not a lot of people know about. So I urge you to take this message and talk to your peers, talk to your students, inform them, point them in the right direction um, so that we all can become more knowledgeable about this issue and move forward to a brighter future. And I, I would like to say uh, two things. We, 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 we have many organizations. Uh, the video was going to talk about what the organizations are doing, but you can go in. Uh, in the internet, uh, www.generation51.org. Uh, you can find us in Twitter. You can find us in in uh, Facebook. Uh, we have the Civic uh, uh, Statehood Coalition. Also, uh, we have the Movimiento Boricua Ahora Es. Uh, but uh, as I was asking Rosie to remind me this. Uh, I, I want to quote this lat for the last time, this situation. Uh, and and is, uh, or, or quote this Einstein. Once you have the knowledge, you have the obligation. Once you have the privilege of the knowledge, you have the obligation to act. So please, 
please. I mean, Jesus Christ uh, has made one of the biggest movements in the world in history, and he started him and 12 disciples. We can do much more, because we're much more than 12 disciples. But now that you have the knowledge, and, and my, I had three purposes here, and, and, and the foremost, most important was to bring awareness on this issue. If we've done that, I feel happy. I, I've, I, I'll please request for you to, to support the movement of, of statehood. If, if, you, if you're not convinced of statehood, we can talk about it, but then do something and change the actual status of Puerto Rico. Please, uh, you can do it whether you're Colombian, whether you're African American, whether you're Italian, whether you're Mexican, whether you're Puerto Rican, it, it, all it takes is to be an American citizen. Give us the privilege and give us your hand. Extend uh, our voice through your vote, through your vo votes, please. And uh, to the professor who uh, distributed some information, he was great, I, I, I received it. I was, I was pumped when I saw the information he was sharing. Uh, thank you very much, okay? And I look forward for some other moments if I visit uh, uh, New Jersey to, to be with you, to discuss with you. Uh, I'm sorry that the presentation I feel was kind of like uh, bented, okay? But we'll, we'll have some other moments, okay? To, 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 to better this. But as of today, thank you and if God is going to bless America, it has to bless Puerto Rico. Thank you.